Thank you all for being here this evening. My name is Ray Jonas. I'm a professor in the History Department, and it's my privilege to uh, serve as Master of Ceremonies tonight, introducing our speaker, Professor Robin Stacy. My role as MC, though, involves a, a, a couple of items uh, preliminary to that. First of all, I want to recognize as guests the students from Nathan Hale High School. We had a, 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 a delightful preliminary uh, conversation about Joan over, uh, over pizza. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the UW retirees who have arrived as a group, I gather. And wherever you are, welcome. I also want to remind everyone that uh, tonight's lecture will be followed by a question and answer session. And I imagine that you all know how this works by now, but I'm going to repeat it anyway. And that um, the instructions are that at, you know, you, you, by now many of you will have cards. If you don't have them, you can flag one of us down and we'll get one for you. But if you have a question in the course of tonight's lecture, write it down at the and when Professor Stacy is finished, we'll collect those cards. Someone's going to win a gift card. <laughs> <laughs> but but we're going to we're going to collect those cards and um, and then we'll 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 present them to to Professor Stacy. Uh, we'll, we'll you know we won't get to all of them, but we'll get to a uh, select number of them. I also want to say that there'll be about a two or three minute, um, you know, interval from the end of the of the of the lecture until the question and answer session begins. So, if you have to leave, that's your moment to leave. Um, you know, let yourself out so that uh, the Q and A session, the discussion section, can go forward without interruptions. Um, so, you know, welcome to the fifth and final lecture in this series, the history lecture series for this year. I hope you don't mind that I depart from the conventional introduction. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> By now you've been introduced to, many of you at least have been introduced to Robin Stacy so many times that you know the details of her distinguished career as well as I do, and as well as any of our other colleagues do. So I'm going to skip over the litany of publications and honors and prizes and distinctions, not out of disrespect, but out of, um, uh, let, let's, let's call it mercy, because uh, <laughs> we've, been, we've, we've been through it. And, and I know Robin doesn't need the, the she, she deserves every bit of the praise. But I just wanted to you know, acknowledge my association with Robin goes back to my earliest days at the University of Washington. Uh, she and her husband, uh, what's his name? Um, <laughs> she and her husband arrived a year or two after I did. Um, I soon learned that uh, Robin had done study abroad uh, as an undergraduate um, <clears throat> at Strasbourg. Really great choice of a place to live in France. And on the basis of that mutual affinity for France and things French, we, uh, we got acquainted with one another. Um, uh, unlike Richard Johnson, who you may know, who once he learned I was interested in France, held me responsible for every silly thing that the French people ever did. <laughs> sort of a goofus and gallant relationship. Um, but I just want to acknowledge now having Robin as a colleague in history has you know, been one of the great you know, the highlights of my experience at the University of Washington. She's really been a model of reason, of collegiality, and forbearance, uh, which we need to draw upon from time to time. Uh, and that's made her really you know, one of the, you know, being part of being a colleague is one of the pleasures of being part of this department. Well, you didn't come to hear me talk, so. Uh, let me just point out that this is uh, Professor Stacy's fifth and final lecture in the Medieval Made Honor Modern series, and tonight's lecture is entitled Interpreting Joan. Thank you, Ray. And um, uh, if anybody wants to pass in that gift card to me, I'd be, I'd be interested in this. This is the first I've heard of a gift card, so I'm very intrigued. Um, uh, welcome to the Nathan Hale students um, tonight. 
Uh, my son went to Roosevelt, sorry about that, but I feel certain, like 100% that he partied with some of your predecessors. So <laughs> it's almost just as good. All right. So tonight we're going to be talking about Joan of Arc, who is really one of the enigmatic figures in the series, known as La Pucelle, the maid. That's how she called herself. Um, it's how she preferred to be known. Uh, like the Templars from last week, she was undoubtedly a historical figure, but she's one of those who is paradoxically close to us and distant from us. There's a ton of evidence that I'll describe a little bit later on, but it's all mediated through other people and sources and judgments and all of that sort of thing. And that means that she has been interpreted, reimagined, et cetera, hundreds of times throughout the, um, throughout the ages. She's essential for me in this series, partly because she is so flexible in terms of how she was imagined, partly because, and I'll, I'll spend some time thinking about or talking about this, um, she matters to individuals and individual identities as well as to issues of high politics, and partly because she is more than any of the other uh, symbols we've talked about in this series, still very much actively contested. Um, talk about this issue of who owns the past. As you can see, I put up a, a few um, uh, headlines here from contemporary newspapers. Joan is still very much in the news. She's very much someone that people try to associate themselves with and most importantly for our purposes, have very different visions of. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Now, so who was Joan? Some of you will know the basic outline of her story, but um, it's a compelling one. She is a peasant girl who took up arms and saved France at a key moment in the Hundred Years' War. She started hearing voices at age 13 or 14, um, and eventually those voices began telling her to save France. Eventually, under interrogation, she identified the voices as Saints Michael, Catherine, and Margaret, but that does not seem to have been uh, part of her early experience, at least as reported, um, as to what those voices were. She wins the support of the French prince, she dons men's clothes, leads men in battle, wins some key battles, is captured by the English in 1430 after a mission of not much more than a year, she is questioned and tried by the University of Paris, then very much in English control, and burned as an idolater and relapsed heretic. The English are later kicked out of France, and she there is begins a new trial of rehabilitation um, promoted by her mother, um, and she, that new trial results in a different verdict. By this time, the English have been kicked out of France, so the verdict this time is that her earlier condemnation was unjust um, and she is uh, reinstalled as a uh, prominent figure in France. She is not made a saint until 1920 in um, circumstances that I will describe. Now, just to put this on a map so you can imagine it, Joan, um, uh, the France in, in Joan's period looked a lot like this. Imagine the red here as occupied by English troops the blue as occupied by the troops of the French prince um, that Joan was supporting. Yellow is occupied by Burgundy, who at this moment in time are allied with France. And the basic issue here, which had arisen from years of war, um, was who had the right to be king of France. Um, and in 1420, after years of war, um, the prince's father, Charles VI, also known as the Mad, which tells you something about him, um, had made a treaty with the English that called for um, a marriage between the English king and his daughter and for the throne of France to then pass to their children. This disinherited his son, and it is his son, soon to become Charles VII, who was Joan's prince. So that's the basic um, setting 
for this. And as you can see, the English control a lot of France at this time, including, of course, the key town of Paris and of Reims, which is the traditional coronation site for French kings. Um, I've marked here where these, these early steps start. Joan's village of Domremy is right here. When she starts to um, believe uh, to, that her voices are telling her to go rescue France and to rescue Charles's kingship, she goes to the, um, to the troops at Vaucouleurs there. Um, she persuades them, a man named Robert de Baudricourt, she persuades them to help her. They take her to the king at Charles, at Chinon, uh, to the prince, he's not yet crowned king, at Chinon. Um, there she convinces enough of the courtiers that they say, well, okay, we're willing to go with this, but we want her examined first theologically to make sure she's who she says she is, that she's real, not some loon. Uh, they send her to Poitiers to be examined, um, and she comes back as given troops, and her first act is to liberate the town of Orléans. And Orléans had been besieged for quite a while, and it was an absolutely key fortress. It's right on the Loire, and it's kind of the entryway into the lands held by um, Joan's prince. That victory was a huge victory for her. It is something that put her on the map and convinced the French that they were right to listen to her. Uh, some pictures of this. This is her house at Domremy. Um, uh, a, uh, a drawing of the siege at Orléans, and this is um, Joan's prince, soon to become Charles VII. Now, our evidence for Joan's life, as I say, relatively speaking, considering how early it is, there's a lot of it. There's specifically transcripts of the interrogations and trial held in 1431, um, and then also transcripts of the evidence um, and trial held uh, in, after her death in the 1450s. So there is quite a lot of evidence for questions that she was asked and answers that she uh, returned. There are tons of government records. There are lots of chronicle and contemporary observer accounts. As you can imagine, Joan was a very public out there figure who excited a lot of um, interest. Uh, so people talked about her and wrote about her. There are letters from um, commanders, contemporaries, et cetera. And then of course there are the legal decisions and articles of accusation. What gets in the way of us hearing her voice is the fact that Joan herself was illiterate um, and she did learn to sign her name but what this meant is that everything we have was either dictated by her to a scribe, and she had a personal scribe with her to do this, or it is mediated by her questioners and judges um, at the trial. So um, how reliable that is, um, you know, we, we, we have to use it, but anytime you're dealing with mediated evidence, you're going to have to think about, uh, about that, that issue. I just thought I'd show you what some of these look like. We have nine of the original or uh, contemporary copies of letters written by her, and by written by her, I mean dictated by her to the scribe. Uh, there are two here. This is a hair that is pressed into the wax seal of one of them. And this was a, 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 uh, a way in the Middle Ages of showing that the document, the letter um, that had been sealed was in fact sealed by the person who signed it. So this is probably Joan's hair right there. And this will give you a flavor of some of these letters. Um, I'll just give you a few minutes to, to look over this, written in 1429. And I've put in yellow some of the things that are really outstanding to me about it. First of all, almost everything she writes or says begins with Jesus, the names of Jesus, and Mary, um, uh, always uh, first and foremost for her. Um, she is addressing the King of England, but she's not shy about doing that. And she's not shy about speaking on behalf of the King of Heaven, of God. Return the keys to the cities you have seized to the maid. She is sent by God to reclaim the royal blood. 
course, Charles. Um, she, she speaks of herself as the commander of the military, and then she threatens what the consequences will be if they do not listen. The maid will have them all killed. She comes sent by the king of heaven, body for body, to take you out of France. Um, she and her troops will raise a mighty outcry. Uh, the king of heaven has sent her so much power that she won't be able to do anything harm for her or her army. I say to you in God's name, beware of the maid. You have no rights in France from God, the king of heaven, and the son of the Virgin Mary. As you can tell, she is not shy about speaking on behalf of God. Right? Imagine this in context. Even in today's context, it would be controversial. Um, in this context, certainly so. And here's another one, a little shorter one. The background for here, this is written to the French people of the city of Troyes. Um, and you, she's got a kind of, um, a not hectoring tone, but definitely admonishing tone. Um, Jean, Jean the Virgin makes known to you uh, that you should render true obedience and recognition to the noble king of France. Well, the background behind that is that this treaty that had been negotiated in 1420, by which Joan's prince had been disinherited and the line of France supposed to pass to the, uh, the offspring of the combined um, English and French royal families, um, this meant that many Frenchmen actually did not support the disinherited prince, Joan's disinherited prince. And a, not, a lot of these towns were not all that excited about rendering obedience to him, especially if English troops were sitting on their territory at the time. Uh, and I think one can always um, uh, appreciate that kind of perspective. Um, and you'll see here again um, who she's speaking for, into the towns which should be part of the holy kingdom. France is not just France. It is the holy kingdom of France for her. Again, um, I commend you to God. May God protect you. Um, etc. Now, um, Joan spoke a good game, and at the beginning, she she came forward. She she uh, uh, came forward with a number of victories. The two major ones, the outstanding ones that everybody refers to, are first of all the victory at Orleans, raising the siege, which I think pretty much the French camp and. Certainly the French prince had given up being the idea that they were going to be able to do that. Shortly after that, she accomplished something that's still something of a marvel. Somehow she manages to um, get the king and some of his guard all the way across enemy territory to, to Reims to be crowned. And that's actually almost as miraculous as the relief of, of um, Orléans, because there are a number of, of towns in here that are not necessarily friendly to Charles. And this is, of course, territory that is occupied by England at the time. So that itself was seen as really, wow, you know, she's a miraculous person and she's accomplishing this miraculous thing. Unfortunately for Joan, her luck runs out, or in medieval terms, perhaps God stops listening to her or stops favoring her. In September of 1429, she attacks Paris on the feast day of the Virgin Mary. Now, had she succeeded in her goal, this would probably have been interpreted as having had the aid of the Virgin Mary. She fails and is wounded. And as a result, it was widely interpreted on both sides, I might add, English and French, as something that was a dishonor to the Virgin Mary, and therefore the reason she lost, and a kind of hint that she might have lost God's favor. May of 1430, she's actually captured at Compiègne by a man of John of Luxembourg, who's allied by the Burgundians, um, and that kind of spells the end of her active military career. Was her capture an inside job? I think there's a fair amount of evidence to suggest it might have been. Um, we, we, we don't know this for sure, but we do know that there was a tremendous factionalism at court. There were a lot of people who were not that enthused about her, who, who perhaps had had doubts 
from the very beginning about whether she actually came from God, but who had certainly developed doubts in the wake of her, her um, defeats and certainly the defeat at Paris. Um, and to tell you the truth, Charles himself was not all that eager to keep going. Um, after the crowning at Reims um, and the victory at Orléans, Joan was pressing, pressing, pressing for the French king to go and take Paris. Um, and it's pretty clear from the sources reading between the lines that she was really annoying the king. He was not interested in doing this. He was actually starting to talk about making a truce um, and coming to terms, and she would not have that. She was absolutely um, against that. And there is a real possibility that um, her capture was not accidental. The commander at Compiègne, Guillaume de Flavie, <coughs> um, was uh, a relative of one of her enemies at court. He ordered a retreat back into the city walls. Jones stayed behind heroically defending the rear guard and the gates of the city are locked against her. And she is left outside and that's how she uh, comes to be captured. Um, John of Luxembourg then kind of sits on the situation for a few months, probably because <laughs> he seems to have an elderly female relative who's a big fan of Jones, who also has a lot of money. And he's looking to kind of come into that inheritance. Well, as soon as she dies, he sells her to the English. In the fall of 1430, she is transferred to Rouen for a church trial, church interrogation and trial, which is conducted by clerics at the University of Paris, Frenchmen, in other words, but Frenchmen very much under the control of the English um, sovereign. She's interrogated between January and March 1431. On May 24th, she's shown the stake. She's brought out to the marketplace in Rouen and shown the stake. She abjures, she, she uh, recants, in other words, and, um, and says, you know, rejects her voices and rejects um, her male clothes. She dons female clothes. Four days later, she appears in male clothes, recants, and then is burned at the stake as an idolater and relapsed heretic two days afterwards. And this is where um, the burning took place. Obviously, there's um, uh, memorials there. Now, there are all sorts of questions raised about Joan's life uh, and her mission and how what happened happened. One of the obvious ones is why did they believe her in the first place when this peasant girl with no military experience, illiterate, um, shows up saying, I have been chosen to save France. Naturally, there's a great deal of skepticism, I think you can say. Um, it's undoubtedly helped by the fact that her prince does not have a lot of options at that point. He's looking pretty um, clearly at losing. But there are also some aspects of the medieval period that would explain why they listened to her. Uh, one was the circulation of a prophecy in France that a virgin would come from Lorraine, which is where her, her house is, her village is, who would save France. And she looks kind of like that person. The other is a good long tradition, medieval tradition of saintly female visionaries, of mystics who um, joined with God in mystical visions um, and who, although themselves female and, and not powerful in the church, um, uh, because of their kind of mystical ability to join with the divine, ended up exercising a great deal of power um, uh, even though they were not part of the hierarchy. Joan of Arc doesn't have all of what you might call the symptoms of your typical female mystic of the time, but she's not totally out of line for that. Um, she's definitely um, a, a possible, um, a possible mystic, uh, a recognizable figure, in other words. The other question is kind of on the other end of things. Once she's captured, why did not French not try to ransom her? Because ransoming um, high value captives was the normal thing. Um, and there's no indication that Charles tried either to ransom her or to rescue her. 
even at a time before she'd been taking, uh, taken to Rouen, which is all the way in the west. Um, and this probably has to do with the fact that there were so many people who were starting to doubt her. She had had these victories, but then she'd had these defeats. She was very devout, but then she'd attacked Paris on the Virgin's feast day. There were other things that were beginning to worry people about, you know, is she really who she says she is? Um, when she was captured, she was wearing a cloak made of cloth of gold, a very lavish material. Um, and indeed, she, she enjoyed some luxurious possessions and had even been ennobled by the king. And that's not quite what you expect of your saint, let's put it that way. So that was, that was kind of... Um, a little off, let's put it this way. And of course the king himself is, is clearly getting annoyed or leery or, or whatever. I just watched The Messenger last night and there's a moment when Charles, who is played as this complete idiot, um, is sitting in the bathtub and he says, oh, I wish you'd just go home. And I gotta say, you'd get some of that from the sources that she, he wishes she'd, you know, she'd done her bit, now it's time to go home. But the most critical issue is, of course, this one. <laughs> How do you tell if somebody comes to you saying, I'm a saint, you know, come to rescue France. How do you tell the difference between someone who truly is from God and someone who's from the devil trying to deceive you or someone who's just mad, insane? How do you tell the difference? Is she a pious woman in touch with the divine or is she an idolater or a fake, or worse yet, and we'll see that this issue becomes front and foremost, um, someone who's trying to exercise a male role when she is visibly, physically a female, and therefore somebody transgressing against God's gender boundaries. This is a big question about Joan of Arc, and it's one that um, uh, many people have doubts on. It's one of the reasons we think that it's possible that the capture was an inside job. The biggest hurdle for both sides in all of this, the biggest thing they don't know what to do with is the fact that she wore the dress of a man. She is asked about that time and time and time again in in the interrogations. And these are the answers that she gives. You can tell they're kind of all over the map. And they're also so vague, they don't directly answer it. It's necessary. I don't have God's permission to wear anything else. This one, the dress is a small thing, the least thing. Um, it's very hard for us, you know, uh, umpteen hundred years later to, to find her voice in this, to understand exactly what she meant. And of course, it was very difficult for the people at the time also to understand that. At times, she will agree during her interrogation, she'll agree to wear a dress, particularly if she's allowed then to, to hear mass, which she's always asking for. But when they bring the dresses, she never changes into them. Um, and this is one of the big obstacles, one of the big questions. People don't quite know what to do with this. Um, and in fact, you'll, you'll notice when I went through this whole um, bit of how she comes to be burned, she's burned because she's a relapsed heretic, um, because she, you know, she is shown the stake and she says, oh, you're right, I recant everything I've said. It's, I mean, I, I abjure everything I've said. I'll go back, I'll dress in female clothes, I'll stop talking about my voices, etc. cetera. Um, and then she relapses. She appears in male dress and starts talking about her voices again. Um, and the, it is the male dress that is the sign that she has um, gone back on her confession. And you can imagine all sorts of situations here. Um, sometimes, and in fact, many movies play it out in different ways, and some uh, male guards take away her clothes so she has no, or her female clothes so she has no alternative. In others, um, they, um, they sexually assault or perhaps even rape her when she shows up in a dress because the male garb that is somehow a sign of her special status is gone. Um, you know, if you're uncertain as to whether somebody's a saint, 
you're probably not going to rape them. But if their special sign of their, their, you know, their potential sanctity is, is still, still uh, is taken away, then maybe it doesn't look like such a fearsome crime. This is an essential issue, this issue of dress. There are more articles of condemnation and accusation that relate to this issue than to any other single aspect of her actions. And I've just given you here a couple to give you the sense of it. She dresses in an outfit customary for a man. She says she has God's command to wear male clothing, so she must have this. She has a male haircut, and she did not want, nor does she wish to resume the clothing of a woman. Another one, this woman is apostate because she has had the hair God gave her cut off for an evil purpose. She has abandoned the clothing of a man, of a woman, and is dressed like a man. This is a central, central issue for them, um, and again for both sides. But this is not ish, an issue on which Christian tradition is monovocal or all that clear and consistent. On the one hand, there's a clear, consistent idea that the idea that a female might triumph over a male or might be um, uh, located, superior to a male, there's a clear idea that that's an inversion of God's hierarchy. You can see this uh, thing. This is a misericord. These are little, um, uh, little uh, sculptures that are under the seats in choirs in some cathedrals. And, and they're, they're sort of counter-cultural things. They're things that are not wanted um, because your rear end is gonna be closest to it. If you're ever in a cathedral, you can um, surprise your friends and, and fellow tourists by going along and checking under the seats of, of uh, cathedral seats to look to see if you find any of these things. And the idea here, the wife feeding the husband, the idea here is that's the reverse of how it's supposed to be. Right? There's a poem in Joan's era, obviously referring to her, forbidden in the Bible to commit the idolatry to wear a dress that belongs to a man, and this proverb, a woman who talks like a man is no good to have around. So on the one hand, there's a very clear sense of what the gender hierarchy ought to be. On the other hand, and this is where it gets complicated, the Catholic Church has a long tradition by this point of cross-dressing female saints. And the French and the English both are aware of this. This, uh, this, this um, uh, uh, story pattern, tale pattern, is rooted in patristic theology, uh, where Jerome and Ambrose both write about a woman who becomes so pious, so devout, that she wishes to serve Christ more than the world. She will cease to be a woman and be called a man. She progresses into maleness in terms of her spirituality. Ambrose, she who believes progresses to perfect manhood, dispenses with the name of her sex. That's patristic theology, but there's also stories, hagiographical hey, stories, saints' lives stories that go along with this, that tell of all these saintly women who disguise themselves as men in order to live a life that is apart from the life normal for people of their sex. Um, and I've got up a couple here. The Saint Margaret is a woman who runs away, fleeing a sort of normal married life. She joins a monastery, cuts off her head, joins a monastery, becomes Brother Pelagius, where she's so holy and devout, she's eventually elected abbot. <laughs> and it's only when, they, when she dies that they find out, oh, <laughs> oops. Um, and there's a whole bunch of others here, too. A great favorite among the Anglo-Saxons for some reason. And this one actually develops a beard um, uh, so that she won't have to marry. Um, she prays to God for this. And, there, and there's discussion of this in theology. These are regarded in theology as true lies because they're, yes, you know, it's a female masquerading as a man, but it, it's done not in order to pretend, uh, or not in order to usurp male authority, it's done in this kind of perfect manhood of Jesus and of religion, as opposed to someone like Joan, um, who is um, uh, visibly a woman, 
who's acting like a man. So when you look at her, you say, that's a woman taking on a guy's job and a guy's role. It's not the same at all as, you know, Margaret hiding out as Pelagius with no, no public recognition of uh, a female at all because her fem femininity has been um, usurped or embodied into the, the male role. She's, she's not, she's, she's uh, passing as a man, not a female who is visibly acting like a man and taking on a male role. That's Joan's problem. Um, that's what she's doing. Now, the other sign of uh, Joan's saintliness, as opposed to being a witch or a heretic or whatever, is her virginity. And that's probably why she proclaims her virginity at every moment in time. Um, sex is always the sign of a devil. This has always been one of my favorite sayings from Bernard of Clairvaux. So there you go. Always for the woman and not to have sex with her is harder than to raise the dead. Uh, he's certainly well, isn't he? Um, <laughs> anyway, um, but uh, you know, one of the things that, that um, Joan has going for her is is that she's a, a virgin. And believe me, everybody investigates that at every turn um, to make sure that she is a virgin because that is the best evidence that she is divinely inspired instead of, of, of being, you know, just some woman who wants to take over a man's role or whatever. If the English are going to get rid of her, they have to prove she's just an ordinary woman pretending to be um, uh, uh, to usurp male authority. None of this is enough. She's condemned and burned at the stake. Um, the next trial um, happens in 1455-56. Um, by this time, the English have been kicked out of France altogether. Charles makes his deal with Burgundy. Um, and so he is in a great position at this point. And at the request of Joan's, Joan's mother, um, they begin a rehabilitation trial where they bring witnesses and testimonies, et cetera, to rehabilitate Joan of this charge of heresy. Understand that while for her mother this was about Joan, for the king it wasn't about that at all. For the king, what this rehabilitation trial is all about is his own reputation cleansing it of any suspicion that he owed his throne to the help of a heretic or, uh, or witch. So, but they go through this whole formal procedure. In fact, some of the people that were involved as interrogators and judges in the first one are also involved in this one, which is quite weird. Um, and this rehabilitation trial uh, taking place, you know, 25 years after death, whatever, um, is, um, is just as orchestrated, just as fake testimony as was the original. It's just for the other side. Um, indeed, as I say, I think this is the first reimagining of Joan of Arc taking place not that long after her death. And in this rehabilitation trial, the French have the same problem. Why did she cross dress? Just as the English needed to prove that she was just a normal, lustful, sinful, heretical woman so she could show, they could show she wasn't sent from God, the French need to show that she's a normal, humble, obedient, subservient, would have just gone out with the sheep and hung out woman who donned men's dress because it was convenient while she was fighting to save France, but after that she would have gone home and just, you know, tended sheep. In other words, both sides for different purposes, needed to re-feminize her, needed to cast her as a woman. The English as the weak, sinful, uh, arrogant woman, the French as the weak, pious, humble woman um, appointed by God for this temporary role. And you can see this in the evidence of the rehabilitation trial. Look at this, this is an evidence brought forth. Person after person, witness after witness, comes forward to say, that they heard her talk about how much she really loved housework. <laughs> I wanted to spin my mother, you know, I wanted to hang out with the sheep. Um, I only traveled in those clothes because it was easier. Um, it's not a, a big deal. 
Other witnesses testify to her femininity. She was very pious, that she certainly was. She felt great piety, uh, pity, um, great mercy, etc. She showed comfort to the enemy just as a woman would. One guy, this is great, testifies to the fact that, um, that he, she, even though they slept side by side, she was so pious and devout he would never have carnal feelings about her. And the very next guy gets up and says, well, actually, I had carnal feelings about her, <laughs> but she slapped me down, right? So they're getting kind of both, both types of woman, but the main point is still the same um, to prove um, who she was. A uh, big surprise, the outcome in the rehabilitation trial is <laughs> that the previous trial was just nonsense, and, um, and they declare it null, non-existent, without value or effect, and you can insert as many euphemisms um, as you want. Um, interestingly and deliberately, the trial does not declare that Joan was holy. It does not validate its mi her mission. It's aimed really entirely at exonerating the king by saying, that first pile, uh, that first trial was a crock of whatever. Now, from the medieval period on, sorry, couldn't resist. I mean, there really, there aren't a lot of good jokes about John of Arc, let's face it, so we go with the seal when we can, that's what we do. From the medieval period on, her image continues to expand, um, and there are two principal paths. Um, one is politics. So um, fairly soon after her rehabilitation trial, we see the city of Orléans, the one she had liberated the siege in, um, celebrating its liberation and developing a special relationship with Joan. They commemorate statues, paintings, um, monuments, etc. cetera. Uh, they commission those, I mean, sorry, they have festivals, et cetera. Um, look at these paintings, <laughs> they're hilarious. There's Joan of Arc there. I don't know what to say about how she looks, but there we are. And look at this. <laughs> That's a sword, believe it or not. That's supposed to be a sword. It looks like a toothpick. Um, but um, clearly they're of different minds about why Joan was important and who she really was. Um, but there you are. Um, and you see this progress through the centuries. Um, 16th century, she emerges as a sign of the Catholic League against the Protestants and the wars of religion. 17th century writings, you find her um, uh, 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 compared to or, or de depicted as um, these various classical female figures, um, the virtues, Amazons, etc. cetera. Um, she's becoming in these works a, a kind of national savior described in class of, uh, classicizing terms. A number of other cities start taking up um, what Orleans had, had already begun and start doing all these civic um, festivals. And by the 18th century, you've got her more and more as a symbol of the nation, prosperity, uh, et cetera. And you can see some of these ideas developing in the way she's um, depicted. So she's increasingly more and more widely revered. The only exception here is Voltaire. And this actually is the one joke one can tell about Joan of Arc. He writes this satirical poem, The Maid of Orléans, which is absolutely obscene um, and, and is not well received. Let's put it that way. The basic premise of it is that Joan of Arc has promised um, as a wife to Dunois, who had been one of the military commanders she'd worked with, but she has to prove that she can abstain from lust and protect her chastity for a year. And this whole poem goes through all these various assaults on her chastity, and it's a near run at the end when an ass comes to woo her, and she nearly, nearly gives in because, oh heavens, what an ass this ass is. <laughs> Voltaire was widely criticized for this. He probably... Um, got this one wrong. And actually, in 1878, 
um, uh, on his death day and hers are the same day, actually, different years, obviously. But um, there's actually riots in the street <laughs> um, uh, uh, against him because of this. So there we are. She's also not terribly popular with the leaders of the French Revolution because she was such a monarchist and a Catholic. In fact, that's why we don't have her sword or her banner, because they destroy them, melt them down. They make a cannon out of her sword. <laughs> but Napoleon gloms onto her again. He reclaims her as a nationalist symbol. Look at this statement. The illustrious career of Joan of Arc. No miracle French genius cannot perform in the face of a threat against national freedom. So, uh, Ray, when um, next time Richard... Um, uh, bugs you about the French, you just answer him with that. And you can see all these various medallions and statues that get, um, get made. And this increases through the 19th century. Number of equestrian statues, especially when Alsace-Lorraine is lost to Germany. Uh, remember her village was in uh, Lorraine. In, uh, uh, there are a number of sort of, um, she becomes a particularly important symbol there. And there's basically just a growing popular cult, and some of them are, set, are centered around cities like Orléans. There's a huge cult centered at Domremy, um, her, her house, her village. Uh, 1878, there's a duchess who throws a huge party there um, in honor of Joan, 15,000 people in attendance to celebrate, um, to celebrate Joan. Now, how does she get canonized, made a saint? That is a, a separate but related story. Um, throughout the 19th century, um, there's increasing concern in the church about growing secularism in France. Um, and that is probably what causes the Bishop of Orléans, no, Orléans, um, uh, who's a real right winger, to preach a sermon on Joan in 1869 that ends in his calling, um, uh, uh, presenting a petition that she be canonized, made a saint of the Roman Catholic Church. And he and others begin gathering a dossier of documents to prove that she deserves saint, uh, saint, uh, saintliness um, in the 1870s and 1890s. This anti-clericalism is heightened by the Dreyfus Affair that some of you will be aware of, a Jewish army a captain um, who is wrongfully convicted more than once of treason. Um, it reveals horrible anti-Semitism um, and uh, the conflict between those who support him and those who do not becomes quite um, ferocious. Joan is taken up as a symbol by both sides um, because she's pretty flexible. The Dreyfus supporters claim, well, Joan also suffered injustice at the hands of government. Um, and in, at the hands of the organized church. The, um, those who are against Dreyfus um, uh, point to her you know, ardent um, devotion to the church, um, that she promoted state power and the monarchy at all costs, um, and she becomes a major symbol not only for them, but for the proto-fascist Action Française that grows out of that group, um, and it is and this um, capacity that um, right-wing Catholics in France um, begin to uh, push her candidacy, candidacy for, um, for uh, saintliness. Um, and it is that background of increasing anti-clericalism, the church is desiring to get back some of this popular enthusiasm, a way to bolster the church, and they they get on the Joan train and um, start pushing her sainthood again. It's turned down the first time, but um, the next pope, who's very, very right wing, um, uh, starts the process that sees her through, and she is canonized in 1920. World War I, she's now an established patriotic symbol for France. French troops carry her image into battle, and there's this amazing story about how at one point on the battlefield, a German searchlight goes up into the clouds, and the French troops see it as Joan appearing to them in a vision in the lighted clouds. 
um, uh, and that, you know, that's kind of amazing. Um, the French buy the, her house at Don Remy for the nation after a, a German threatens to buy it first. And you can see some of these kind of patriotic uh, songs and cards and drawings and things like that where she is shown as the defender of France. World War II, both sides of, uh, make use of her. She's a symbol both for de Gaulle and the Free French um, fighting against Vichy. There's the symbol. And she's a symbol for the pro-German side, for Vichy and the German-occupied zone. Rouen, where she is burned, is in the German-occupied zone. Look at this poster. The criminals always come back to the scene of their crime, claiming that the Allied bombing of Rouen is the same thing as, as the French burning Joan earlier. And she's still in contention today. I think I showed on the first day uh, this particular slide. She is the absolute heroine of Marine Le Pen's right-wing national front. They, she holds a big um, gathering there every, every year um, in front of the Joan statue. But look at this. One year later, a poster of Joan of Arc kissing Marianne, the French symbol of liberty, in a same-sex marriage poster when that was up for election. As I say, she's quite flexible. <laughs> and this brings us to the second and, and last part I want to talk about, the second principal part of her afterlife, and that is Joan as a woman who takes on male clothing, male clothes, etc. She is already, and I think I would use the word feminist in this context, a feminist symbol by the time she dies. Um, some of will, you will know of the French writer Christine de Pizan. Her dates are there. She was a, um, very popular around the French court. She writes a lot of works that are, uh, I think one would have to call proto-feminist. They are definitely defense of women's works. And Joan is one of her heroes. Um, uh, Joan because she's holy. Joan because she's a woman. Joan because she saves France. Christine de Pizan, we don't know that they would ever have met. She spent, Christine spends the last decade of her life in a convent, so it's unlikely. But her last known work is The Tale of Joan of Arc, and you see here how she salutes her. What an honor for the female sex. It's obvious that God had special regard for it, in other words, women, um, when the kingdom of France is recovered and made safe by a woman, something 5,000 men could not have done. She's a fascinating figure, and Joan of Arc was her heroine. We don't know when she dies. We don't know if she ever lived to see what happened to Joan of Arc. We don't know that. This is probably about 1429. Romanticism um, seems to emphasize her feminine side. Um, you can see here in some of these amazing portrayals. Um, I, I always think of this as sort of follow the armor. If the armor disappears in favor of female dress or whatever, um, then you know that, that that aspect of her, which aspect of her is being uh, put forward, this kind of very feminine child of nature, simple, devout, etc. She's a very important symbol for suffragettes and feminists, and this continues into the modern day. And the modern day also has provided us with a number of other kinds of Jones, a variety of Jones, queer or lesbian Jones. Um, uh, Probably the earliest writer here is Vita Sackville West, but um, The Second Coming of Joan of Arc by Carolyn Gage is a very important work portraying Joan as a lesbian. Um, the Messenger, um, that one's interesting. It, it kind of portrays her as reacting to a made up act of sexual violence, and it's kind of a portrayal of her as, um, as psychologically uh, damaged. I think. Um, I was telling someone before um, the, the lecture that it has this scene where 
Joan is talking with her conscience and, and you know, obviously we're supposed to be wondering, uh, you know, are these voices she's hearing really God or who are they? Well, it turns out when the conscience is talking to her that it's Dustin Hoffman, <laughs> um, which, which really is, is just kind of a bummer, you know, because after you hear that it's Dustin Hoffman, you can't listen to it seriously. It's unfortunate. Uh, we've got Joan as pseudo-schizophrenic, which is a suggestion here. Joan is a true child in this one. And a Christ-like martyr in this, um, this rather um, famous um, uh, 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 Passion of Joan of Arc by Dreyer. And look at all these images. I'll give you a minute to look at them and to imagine the type of Joan that lies behind them. I think you can see here um, better than anywhere else how flexible she is and how um, the fact of her femininity and of her gender expression during her life has made her um, a, a woman for all seasons. But was she even a woman? So here I want to introduce a play that I unfortunately haven't gotten to see, um, but the possibility of a non-binary Joan is front and center in this play, I, Joan, which showed at Shakespeare's Globe in this past summer, October uh, 2022. It was totally sold out, rave reviews from even conservative papers, which was interesting, widely agreed to be a fascinating play, and having now read the play text, I would agree with that. It features a non-binary Joan who is fighting not only for France, but for the authenticity of herself, which is presented in the play as being very much the same thing. This is Joan here, and as you can see, the cast is not the conventional cast for a movie um, or, or a play about Joan No Dustin Hoffman, but that's not the only issue. It is highly controversial, or was highly controversial, and I thought I'd just give you some, some quotes from the play um, to, to sort of show how interesting it was. Very first words of the play, trans people are sacred. We are divine. We are practicing our divinity by expressing authenticity, by enjoying our multiplicity, we offer you restitution, revolution. We offer you love. The play does not shy away at all from the issue, the modern day issue, of whether trans identity and trans rights is a, th a threat to feminism and the women's rights movement. This is again a, a quote from the play. Man tricked women into hating trans. Women are angry about pronouns and toilets and Twitter and all the wrong things. Women are angry I abandoned them. They'd rather I abandon myself. I am not a weirdo. I am not a woman. I am not a woman. I am a fucking warrior. I just gathered here on this slide some of the reactions that were published um, to this. On the left-hand side, those praising the play and what it accomplishes, self-identity, not just with queer trans lens, but religion, national identity, and expression. The globe itself, the play is alive, queer, and full of hope. On the other side, J.K. Rowling, being kind to one group of people damages another group. Many women have had to adopt maleness in order to be taken seriously. This one, how dare, the Globe tried to cancel history's inspirational women, and then this one, reprehensible sexism. So clearly the play stirred up quite a lot of interest and emotions. And I thought this was a, a kind of interesting few slides with which to end here. What we're seeing here is clearly fighting for the past. Again, this kind of who owns the past. We're also, I think this has to raise the question of our responsibilities to the real past as, as non-historians. Um, I mean, the fact of the matter is that most modern retellings of Joan's story downplay the two aspects of her life that she was most insistent on, as we can see her in Mediated Through the Sources, her faith and her virginity. And this is a critic 
um, who asks the following question. We've created all of these Jones to embody Marxist, Democrat, populist, female heroes, feminist, gay people, and medicalized Joan, Freudian, etc. All these recreations ignore Joan as a woman of unshakable faith in her personal and profound experience of Christianity. Um, and that may be true. So the question is, is that a problem? Is the past freely available for all of us? Is Joan even the issue when it comes to art, when it comes to using symbols to speak about modern political um, uh, uh, divisions and divides. I mean, we've seen a lot of reimaginings in this series that are just funny or fun or whatever. I mean, the Templars, you know, going after zombie Templars, going after vacationing college kids. Uh, what can you say, you know? Um, or, you know, St. Francis um, in liberation theology, he's a Marxist revolutionary. Um, you know, today in most statues outside Franciscan churches, he looks like someone who should have gone to veterinary school. I mean, you know, there are various um, issues that are um, where the life and the afterlife is, doesn't raise serious questions. But there are a lot of these reimaginings that are infinitely more serious. Reimagining and reusing the past is not a neutral act. There can be winners and losers and consequences. When we use the past to think about, uh, with, we assert ownership in ways that can directly affect the lives of others. And one of the things I'd like to put to you is that at the very least, we should understand what we're doing, when we're doing, and why we're doing it. Are we looking to find ourselves in the past, as women or non-binary people or, or whatever, in order to validate our place in the present? Are we looking to find heroes for the modern world and starting with the heroes of the past? Is this why people care whether Robin Hood or Arthur existed, for example? And how do these images work? I mean, this for me is almost the most important thing. Images, myth, is a, such an important and powerful form of speech, partly because so often the narratives implicit in them are never directly stated. I could sit here and I could make a diatribe on some political issue to you, um, and, and you would know what I was doing, right? You would know what I said, my claims would be restricted to what I said, et cetera. But if I try to make those same points by evoking myths, mythic persons, um, mythic groups, first of all, I bring an entire range of ideas into play, even if I don't articulate them directly, um, and I link ideas to one another. If I, if I conjure up Joan as a devout Christian monarchist um, who should be voting for you know, the, the fascists, or if I conjure up Joan as someone who wants to kiss Marianne, I am implicitly attaching those Joans to her importance as a national symbol of France. The, the speaking mythically carries those associations within it. It also carries a number of hidden narratives within it, ideas beneath the surface that one often doesn't say out loud, that one could even deny if one was accused of saying them, that, that, that um, are really powerful. If I talk about the Kennedy administration as Camelot, you know what I'm saying you know what party I likely voted for. If I talk about a budget as Robin Hood in reverse, you know what my position is, what my judgment is. Even if, if I never said it out loud, even if there's nothing directly you can argue with me about. If I call myself a modern day Templar and announce my mission is to defend Christianity from the threats it faces in today's world, you can tell a lot from that from that simple thing that I, that I said, invoking this myth of the Templars. Um, and for many people, that speech will also sound like I'm voicing support for racist or anti-immigrant views. Those are dog whistles that some people hear and some do not. Myth is a very potent form of speech. And it's not just medieval. Some of you will be aware of uh, historian Heather Cox Richardson's 
writings and others, actually, Virginia Scharf has written on this too, on the myth of the American cowboy to the success of movement conservatism. And, and she, she points out here, look at, what, look at what this says, this image says, without saying it. Cowboys are hardworking. They do real work, physical labor. They're Western, they're rural, non-elitist. They're white, they're real Americans. They're male, they're manly. They take nothing from the government. They're non-socialists. They take care of their wife and children. They're manly. They're on their own. They're independent. These are subtexts that attach to the visible text. And it's really, really important that we be able to be aware that this is how myth is speaking and that we be able to hear those texts and subtexts, especially since some of them aren't even true. Not a call boys for white, for example. And I think we'll end here with this um, idea about myth and with one last observation <laughs> that not all mythic subtexts remain forever uh, are, are always evident. Some are always a mystery. And I can't resist pointing this out. This is actually a, a, a piece of advertising copy. Joan of Arc means valiantly transform any ordinary dish. It makes it sound like whatever you made is really bad. And so you've got to use really high quality beans to get there. So anyway, thank you. All right, good. We have some questions. Um, this is from one of our Nathan Hale students. Was the subject of Joan's sexuality ever brought up in her trials at the time? Her uh, sexuality, meaning whether she might be lesbian or gay or, um, or whatever. Um, no, not directly. Um, what was the main concern of the trial was why, as someone who was visibly a woman, was she transgressing gender boundaries? Um, and it's, it's called um, idolatry in the Middle Ages, and I know that that word, to most of us, has a different meaning. Um, but um, for them, this, this idea of someone who is visibly female taking on this role um, that does not belong to her as a man, um, was, was, um, that was the major issue. It was a reversal of the hierarchies intended by God. The question of her sexuality, as in was she actually a virgin, was definitely something they all wanted to know about, and she gets checked out on that um, by both the French and the English. But the question of whether she was, for example, attracted to women sexually, uh, as Carolyn Gage would have it in, in her play, um, that is not the issue. Um, so he, here's, here's one that asks you to uh, offer a comment on her military career. Did she become trained in leading an army or in combat and fighting? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Does, does, does she become trained in leading an army? Oh yeah, does she become trained in leading, leading an army? That's a really interesting question, and it's something of a vexed issue. Um, historians have written on different sides of the question. I mean, of course, from her background, she wasn't trained at all, right? No surprise there. Um, um, and, as, and she herself claimed that she did not kill people. Um, she goes in with her banner. Um, she, I think she's wounded, actually, helping to scale the walls at one point. Um, there, is, uh, there are some historians that have argued that yes, she is very deeply involved in what you might call real battle strategy and battle tactics. She does seem to ride a horse. She does seem to wear armor. All of those are things that are not you know, easy to acquire skills. Um, the fighting, is, as, as far as we know, she didn't do but she does seem to have been involved in tactics and, and strategy. Um, but then there are others who have argued against that um, and argued that 
her role was more um, symbolic, uh, more visible, uh, inspiring the troops, et cetera. So that is an issue that historians themselves still disagree on. Okay, here's, here's one that involves um, her family. This is, did, did Joan of Arc's mother report that her daughter truly had visions? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, did Joan of Arc's mother report that her daughter had visions? You know, I don't know of her saying that, but in general, having said that, her mother supported her in every possible way. And, um, and in fact, the family did too. Um, there's a brother who goes and fights with her also um, and is also ennobled and um, I think is also captured actually with her on the day that she's captured. Um, so they, they generally support her. Um, so it wouldn't be surprising to me if they uh, regarded the visions as valid, but I don't know of any specific testimony to that effect. My guess is they probably would not have asked. Yeah. 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 Here's um, another Nathan Hale question. Um, a really interesting one. You were talking about trying to get at Joan's voice and how her voice is yeah. mediated. So how do you read the evidence as an historian um, without, you know, how do you sift through, how do you assess the, the available evidence? Yeah, about Joan? that is an excellent question. How do you read the evidence? How do you sift through the evidence? Um, and, and to be frank, I, I mean, I think anybody um, who has ever tried to do historical work has encountered this issue. Um, uh, in cases like this where um, a voice is not heard directly, it's particularly challenging. Um, I think you look at the questions, you look at the nature of the answers, you might be able to tell something. For example, the interrogations, that's the sort of one of the main bodies of evidence, right? you might be able to tell from the way the answer is reported as to whether or not it's an answer that Joan is likely to have made. Um, the interrogation were, by the way, in Middle French. They were translated later, a few years later into Latin, but they were in Middle French. So, you know, she's not being interrogated in Latin. Um, that's one way um, that you can try to test that. Um, you can try to intuit something from the reactions um, that others have to, uh, to what she says that can give you a clue as to whether this is likely an accurate representation. Um, but, you know, in many cases, you use it because it's the best we've got, and you use it with caution and the knowledge that it might not you know, be entirely true. Let me give you one specific example, because this is a really interesting one. Um, at one point in interrogation uh, by uh, the first one, the first trial, Joan is asked whether she is in God's grace. Well, now this is a trick question coming from an educated theologian. Um, it's a trick question because you're not supposed to say, yes, I am in grace, because mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, is just as presumption, uh, presumptuous and arrogant and, and um, dishonoring God as it sounds like um, it is. But if you say, no, I'm not in God's grace, <laughs> then obviously you're letting yourself in for that sort of trouble. And, and so that's a trick question. And it's a trick question with some serious intellectual theology behind it. And what Joan answers, or at least what is recorded in the record as her answer is, if I am not in God's grace, may he bring me there. Um, and that, there, in, the, in the record, um, you, you can almost sense the kind of disappointment <laughs> in her interrogators because that's a perfect answer. It sidesteps everything. It's not an intellectual learned answer. It's the answer that a, a pious person might have. You know, I, uh, it, it, she goes on to say, you know, being in God's grace means everything to me. That's the most important thing to me. There is no fault you can find with that answer. That kind of rings true. 
because it's hard to imagine anybody making that up, right? Um, the interrogators are, are stymied by that. Um, so those are the sort of <laughs> tactics or techniques you can use, but obviously sometimes that works and sometimes it's, it's much more difficult. What's interesting about that is that it, um, it, it, it's, it sounds real. Yeah. And goes against what, what I think of the kinds of arguments made centuries later against women. For example, famously Rousseau, that the problem with women is that they dissemble, right. that is, they, they present a false front. Right. Whereas Joan seems to be entirely uh, authentic. Yeah, and, I, and I've got to say, when you read the interrogations, and perhaps this is just my wishful thinking, but I've got to say that when you read her, her answers in the interrogations, so many of them come across as that, mm -hmm. as authentic, as, um, as something that someone would say who is trying to answer from within herself, from within her own spirituality. One of the first things that, uh, one of the first interrogations um, has her say, will you, pro will you um, swear to always tell the truth? Right, well, you know, that could easy, easy be an easy one. Yeah, I will. Or, uh, you know, you're probably not gonna say no, forget it, unless you're planning to go straight to the stake. Joan says, I will tell the truth about things I'm permitted to talk about. And they said, what? <laughs> and she says, things I'm permitted to talk about by God, the things that aren't private between me and God. And I got to say, that rings true to me. Again, it's very hard for me to imagine anyone making that up. Right. Um, and once again, it has the impact of stymieing in fact, it really frustrates them. You can tell that's really irritating to them as an answer. All right, one last question. I think we've worked through very hard. Um, but here we go. So did, did Joan inspire any other women to copy her actions? Um, I, I think Joan has historically inspired many women. Um, and I would just say that um, like many um, strong, interesting women in the past. She has been an inspiration for many women over many centuries. As it happens, she did kind of inspire someone she didn't really want to inspire. So there's a kind of pseudo-fake Joan that shows up when Joan is still um, at her height and tries to sort of hang around saying, hey, I'm a mystic too. And Joan is very skeptical and sort of um, not at all receptive. Um, and in fact, at one point stays up to see if uh, this, this visionary is claiming visits from some holy entity. And Joan actually stays up at night to see. It's kind of like waiting for Santa Claus, right? Um, and so, yes. I guess that would be someone she inspired, but no, not somebody she wanted to inspire, um, which I don't mean to sound facetious um, at all. I think the, the whole issue of mystical revelation and mystical illumination is so tricky. Caroline Bynum makes the comment about the saint as being the flip side of the witch, and that's exactly right. Um, it's a very dangerous type of power to which to, um, to, which to aspire. And um, Joan is playing a, a dangerous game, and I don't mean in any way to indicate that she's playing a game or faking it or whatever. She's in a dangerous world. Um, and um, she's not the only one, but it's, um, it's very real. So. Well, thank you very much, Robin. Thank you.